Wow. Students don't quiet down that quickly. Thank you for coming this evening. My name is Molly Burke. I'm the Dean of the Brennan School of Business at Dominican University, and I'd like to welcome you to our 10th Business and Ethics Leadership Lecture. Tonight, it's a real privilege for us to present a figure whose name is synonymous with ethics and civic leadership, Mr. Patrick Fitzgerald. Thank you for being with us. This annual lecture is a signature event for the Brennan School of Business, and it's a complement to what we present to our students in the classroom. Over the past decade, we've provided members of the business community and our own graduate and undergraduate students opportunities to hear from and engage with a variety of civic, corporate, and government leaders. You can see the list of fairly impressive names in our program. This lecture continues the legacy of Lois and Ed Brennan and, and what they've meant to the Chicago community, two amazing people for whom our school is named. This year's lecture has additional significance, though, as one of the events in which the Brennan School and Dominican University are celebrating our recent accreditation by AACSB International. Only 5% of the business schools in the world have earned that prestigious accreditation, and so you will understand why we are justly proud of, of this achievement. <clears throat> I want to especially acknowledge two individuals who have, whose leadership has made this achievement possible. My friend and colleague, Dominican President Donna Carroll, whom all of us know and highly regard, and Mrs. Doris Christopher, who was called away suddenly on business at the last minute, but who um, has been extremely generous to the Brennan School of Business, endowing our chair in business ethics. You likely know her as the um, chairman and CEO of the Pampered Chef, but she's been a great friend to Brennan and to Dominican, and we appreciate her continued support. Now it's a true privilege for me to present our featured speaker, and, and let me introduce him to you. Um, over the course of his career, Patrick Fitzgerald has become the embodiment of public integrity. As an opponent of crime and corruption, and I will focus on just a few of his many accomplishments. As a young assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York, he handled drug tra trafficking cases and assisted in the prosecution and of organized crime boss John Gambino. He was a key figure in the prosecutions of the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center and the 1998 attacks on the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. In the fall of 2001, he began his tenure as the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, leading numerous high-profile investigations and prosecutions that most of us in the room remember. These include the convictions of two public officials, notably former Governor, Illinois, uh, Governor of Illinois George Ryan and Governor of Illinois Rod Blagojevich, also persecuting corporate leaders such as businessman Conrad Black for corruption and fraud, and a prominent hotel, hired truck, and Operation Family Secrets investigations. At the time, he was noted for the bipartisan approach to persecuting crime, and has been described on multiple um, occasions by varied members of the press as an equal opportunity indicter. <laughs> and, in 2012, he left the U.S. Attorney's Office to join the international law firm of Skardenaps, Megan, and Flom as a partner in its Chicago office. His practice focuses on internal investigations, government enforcement matters, and civil litigation. In addition to his practice, Mr. Fitzgerald lectures and teaches, and I know you're going to hear a wonderful presentation tonight, but he also continues to serve as an ethical watchdog when needed. He was appointed by Governor Pat Quinn to lead the ethics um, efforts of the Northern, Northeastern Illinois Public Transit Task Force. He serves as an independent monitor of Corinthian colleges as they're being investigated by federal regulators. And I could go on and on, but then you'd be hearing from me and not from Mr. Fitzgerald. But the honors and accolades he's accumulated um, are 
equally numerous, top 100 most influential lawyers in America by the National Law Review, member of um, the list of Ethisphere Institute of attorneys who really matter. He um, is someone who inspires us to do what's right, and we're grateful that he's taking the time to be with us tonight. Thank you, Patrick. Well, thank you for that overly kind introduction. So let me start with a disclaimer. I know this is supposed to be the lecture on, on ethics and leadership, and I will call it the talk on ethics and leadership for a couple of reasons. First, I, I, uh, it's hard to say it in this room, but I prefer informality. I'd like to get to the point where we can have uh, questions and answers in more of a dialogue. Uh, it's hard to say it's informal in a wood-paneled room with 200 people in suits, but I think the more, the more informal, the better. Um, the second part of that is I also think that when I think of a lecture, I think of a professor uh, that he or she has studied something for 20 years. Uh, maybe they're splitting the atom, and then they're sitting in front of a room of people who are 18 years old, fresh out of high school and know very little, and the professor is trying to figure out how much of that, that of wisdom they have they can dispense in small doses. And I am not a student of ethics or a student of leadership and, or a person who studied that. I have been through jobs where I've seen it from both ends, where I basically was uh, involved as a prosecutor in evaluating whether institutions um, had ethical issues or persons had ethical issues to wit had committed crimes. Um, and so what I'd simply say is I, I look at this as sort of the reflections on someone who has stumbled into um, looking at issues of ethics and leadership, uh, both by looking at other people's behavior and being involved in the government and helping run an office uh, where you're looking at sort of at yourself and saying, how, how can the office run better? So I, what I think I'll talk about is sort of five, five things I've learned uh, sort of accidentally without trying about ethics and leadership uh, that to me matter in the real world. That's the other reason why I don't want to say lecture, because I think there's a, a part of ethics that can make you feel it's a very, it can be an academic enterprise, uh, how people deal with conflicts of interest. But I think what really matters to folks, and particularly to folks from Dominican, where you're teaching people to go out in the real world and make an impact, is to find out what happens when the rubber hits the road. What happens when someone graduates, passes the exam, takes classes in ethics uh, and, and other principles, or goes to law school, and then ends up in the real world, and, and how, how does it matter? So let me tell you, uh, I'm going to start with my punchline and work backwards. Um, if you talk to people who uh, are in the real estate business, or if you ever try to buy or sell a house, uh, real estate brokers will always say it's about location, location, location. And the point is, all the other things matter, but if you're in midtown Manhattan or in Iowa, it's a difference. If you're downtown Chicago versus the suburbs, it makes the world a difference. When it comes to ethics, to me, what matters is culture, culture, and culture. Uh, and you want to look at an institution and see whether or not it's going to behave ethically, whether the people will behave ethically, it's, it's culture. And I tell you, there's probably a lot of you people who've studied ethics who think, well, that's pretty obvious. Um, there's no revelation there. I have to tell you that for me to give an answer uh, that the answer is culture is not something that comes naturally to me. I, I grew up in, in Brooklyn, as did uh, your president. Uh, and I went to, when I went to school, I was a math econ major. So I was very much linear. You know, there's a right answer and there's a wrong answer. You know, if someone says, do this calculation, what's the answer, correct or incorrect? Other people took classes where you'd read books and write an essay. What was the author trying to do? Um, and people would make a subjective assessment. I liked yes and no, black and white. If you talk to me, I liked hard science. Culture seems so very squishy to me. And then you go to law school and you become a prosecutor and your sense is there's a right and there's a wrong, and there's accountability. If someone starts telling you culture, you start to say to yourself, oh, am I being set up for an excuse? You know, why did you shoot that person? Culture. Um, and so I come to it, and I'm going to come back to that because my, my views have changed. You come to it thinking things are very clearly defined. And the idea of culture just seems very abstract. After working in the government for 24 years and being a prosecutor as a line prosecutor in New York and as U.S. attorney here in Chicago, it hit me in the face year after year that it's, uh, it, it's just ignorant to ignore the role of culture. Culture is a very, very powerful force. It's a force for bad things, and it's a force for good things. And every aspect of things, when you look at the problems this city faces, and you look at the problems of gang violence, there's no denying that people who grow up in different circumstances, where there's no family structure, where there's no hope, where there's no job opportunity, who join a gang, they are going to act very differently 
uh, than had they been another, another opportunity. I'm not absolving people from violence, but I think when we look at the city's problems and we think, how do we get a handle on the violence problem? We have to address the underlying problems, and culture is very important. I also see that uh, when you're a prosecutor, sometimes you see uh, white-collar crime. You see two types of white-collar crime. There are people who are just bad people. You know, Bernie Madoff didn't fall into a Ponzi scheme. You, know, you wake up one morning, you decide, I'm going to pretend to have millions of dollars I don't have. I'm going to rip off charities, and that's just a bad thing. But there are many people who find themselves in trouble uh, in, in the white-collar circumstance that sort of more fall into it. You know, they're working in a business, they're being held accountable to how many sales there are, and if they just met this goal, everyone would be happy. The boss would be happy, the stock would be great, the bonus would be great. And you know what? If you just counted that one-day sales from November 1st for October, wouldn't everything be great? And then the next quarter rolls around, and well, I can count one more day uh, since last time I counted one day, and people find themselves snowballing into things. And you think about it, that depending on the culture that they're brought up in, the, the person's innate characteristics play a huge role, and they're accountable, but what that culture does can push them to be more ethical or less ethical. I have a friend who describes it uh, in the white-collar context as the sort of people walking into a room where people are slicing an onion. If you're in a room when someone starts slicing an onion, and they slice onions slowly, you can be there for an hour and not really notice. Someone else walks into the room, and like, whoa, what's going on here? And so sometimes people end up doing things because of uh, a lack of uh, attention to culture. Let me just say this, when I was in the prosecutor's seat, one of the things we had to do is to decide when it was appropriate to charge a corporation as an institution. We actually took that quite seriously because we recognized it could put a business uh, out of business, it could cost people jobs, it could cost people who invested in the company who did nothing wrong, a lot of money. And the ultimate question we always really wanted to know at the end was a cultural question. Did the company get it? Any enterprise of a certain size is going to have people who do stupid things. And what you'd look at when you dealt with a company or an institution was to say that they just happen to have one of their people go off and do something stupid, in which case that person should be held accountable. Or did they encourage it? Did they look the other way? Uh, or when they found out about it, did they take uh, action? And so at the end of the day, what we were trying to figure out is what we called the tone at the top. Did the company try to make sure that this didn't happen? Are they doing what they can? Are they reacting appropriately? So with that all being said, I I'm thoroughly convinced <clears throat> that culture is extremely important. Um, I, one thing I found odd when I was in the government, to be candid, was sometimes we try to deal with cultural or ethical issues with videos. Um, and someone would go do something stupid, and the next year they'd make you watch a video that you wouldn't do what that other person did that was really stupid, uh, and sign that you watch the video. And lots of lawyers out there, we get continuing legal education, they make sure you take so many hours of ethics. And I understand it to a point, because sometimes the rules are not clear. And the last thing you can do is expect someone to believe, to behave consistent with rules that they don't understand and haven't been explained to them. But I think a whole lot of ethics isn't people not understanding what the rules are. It's people figuring out whether they're going to follow them and whether they're expected to follow them. And so here are my five things I've, I've picked up accidentally along the way in practice, either by having someone give me a tip, uh, watching someone else do it, um, or just you know, screwing it up yourself and realizing you could have done it better. So the first thing I thought about is people who work in organizations, one of the greatest opportunities for them to create an ethical culture where people will have this powerful force drawing them to do better, uh, not you know, better than themselves, is to think about the, the hiring process. And by the way, I give you examples of people drifting off and doing bad things. One of the things you think about is when you look at the stories and you hear about police officers who jump in cars and race to the scene of a gunfire. When you think about 9-11 and you think of the rescue workers running up a building, uh, knowing that they're risking their own lives. When you hear stories about military folks, folks who may have been 18 years old and decided to join the military for discipline and find themselves in combat, and they do heroic things, which they get all credit for, but they do heroic things because a culture is built that you go in there and you defend uh, your fellow troops, and you lay down your life on a grenade to save others. And so we have to recognize that culture can drive people to do um, some bad things. It can drive them to do great things. So the first lesson I, I've picked up that I'm thoroughly convinced of is the hiring process is such an opportunity for an organization to say, we want to be ethical and we're to hire ethical people. I looked at your website and I see that Dominican wants to educate people uh, you know, in, in, in values and make an impact 
uh, of folks who have, who have values, values-based education. Well, if you advertise that and people read that, if they agree with that, they will come to you. If they're not interested, they will go elsewhere. So there's a self-selection process. People don't randomly join the Marines. They decide that is an institution that I respect and I want to join. So you have a, a self-selection process. But you want to get people with good character. You want to have people who are open to that view. And I remember, and I'll, I'll attribute some of these things that people said that shaped me. There was, there was a woman, Z. Scott. Uh, some of the folks here know Z. Scott. And she was one of the people that, when I first got to the U.S. Attorney's Office, was heavily involved in hiring. And you'd look at stuff and you'd say, okay, what is this experience does this person have? How well do they do in law school? What recommendations do they have? All those sort of things. And I remember Z would ask, but does that person have a soul? They're going to make a decision affecting people's lives. Who to charge, how hard to push for punishment, what to do. They're holding people's lives in their hands. And they may be smart, and they may have you know, aced all their exams. They may write like the Dickens. But do you feel comfortable that you're trusting those sensitive judgments to them? And I always remember Z saying, you know, that person has a soul. That person has overcome something. That person has had an experience that will make us better. I remember another person in the office, Vicki Peters, who retired. And I remember her thinking about the ethical question. And you're always worried about what you're not going to find out about. If you're running an office, and we had 170 wonderful lawyers when I left, and you know, 300 plus staff, you're not worried about the collective decisions people will make when they sit in a room together. You're worried about what you don't hear about. Someone who decides they're afraid to share information and make a bad decision. And so Vicky's test I call the Saturday morning test, which is they're involved in a very hotly contested trial. They don't get along with the other side. The other side doesn't like them. You know, they're just personalities. The judge is riding both parties hard. People are paying attention. They really think the person on the other side is guilty. And then they find something on the weekend that's in their files. that They realize they never turned over and should have. And you don't want to have someone working for you who's going to decide on that Saturday morning, gee, if I'd never found that, if I'd never looked in that box this morning, no one would know. Uh, you want someone who's going to say, oops, I'm going to take my medicine. I'm calling up the other side. I'm going to get yelled at. I'm going to have problems. But that's the right thing to do. And Vicky called it that Saturday morning test and getting a sense of whether you could trust someone. And I think that when you look at the hiring decisions, trying to find out from due diligence, from asking people, from probing, whether this is someone you trust is a really, really important part of the process. That's probably self-evident. But the second time, the second point where I think people can make an impact on an organization which could affect the ethical culture is what I call um, the uh, imprinting moment. I've made up that term, um, queuing or imprinting. But it seems to me the very first day someone starts on the job, you can make a real impact. And when I was back in New York, I had a friend who was a supervisor. And I remember when he was a supervisor, he would take all his brand new assistants, because he trained the new folks, and give them a speech about how their credibility is everything, and how a judge ought to trust their word, and that you know, this was important uh, to him, and important to them, and to pay attention. When I came to Chicago, I got an email from a friend of mine, and I was very lucky to have a good friend, Jim Comey, who's now the FBI director, who's taught me a lot of these lessons about what you do when you show up in a place that's an institution that has, uh, that has a history. You remember, you know, paying attention to what happens the first days. What I tried to do when I hired someone is I brought a tradition from New York, which is bring them into a courtroom and have a judge swear them in. It was both a tradition that I liked. It gave people the opportunity to bring their families in and to stand in a federal courtroom, majestic like this is, take, raise their hand, take an oath in front of their spouses, in front of their kids, in front of their parents, in front of their friends. And we would ask them to pick a judge if they had a, a special relationship. And the judges would give heartfelt talks. Some of the judges were former prosecutors, some weren't. They would talk about what the office meant, what the obligations were, what they expected. And I think those moments, when you get someone brand spanking new walking in and giving them that speech, can imprint. And I would always make it a point to tell folks that my speech was the head on the pillow speech which is that you work so hard under so much stress that you should never go home putting your head in the pillow worried about whether you're doing the wrong thing. And if you are, it's your job to come forward and tell anyone, me or anyone else in the office, so we can talk it through. Because you're going to work too hard that you should have the right to feel good about what you do every night. And if you don't, we have to address that. And I had people come back and say, I remember you told me that, and so here's my issue. And I think that was important. My friend Jim, who sort of gave me that lesson, gave a speech when he was before the Senate to be the Deputy Attorney General about how he would give a speech about the reservoir of credibility, that when he walked into court, 
from the Department of Justice, people were trusting him because of all the people that went before him decades before, and that he charged his folks, when you leave, that reservoir of credibility has to be at least as full as when you came in. And remarkably, I think he's a person who's really got the imprinting lesson, because now he's director of the FBI. One of the things he's done is he went in and made a point at his swearing in that he now wanted all the new FBI agents to visit the Martin Luther King Memorial uh, when they're sworn in. So that after he teaches them how to go around and investigate people and how to use surveillance techniques and how to use wiretaps and all those other things, they should go to a memorial for a person whose rights were violated and understand the awesome power they hold. So I think people miss in institutions the opportunity at a very early stage to say we have one priority and whatever the institution is, imprint on them that the ethics and the integrity and the reputation of that institution are first and foremost. The third moment, I think, is that people need to pay attention, particularly in larger organizations, to recognize the CEO can send out a great message. The CEO can be in Silicon Valley and appear in iPads all over the world and say, XYZ Corp is dedicated to integrity. XYZ Corp is dedicated to a culture that's uh, open and honest. But if a person sitting in Chicago or sitting in Bangladesh working for XYZ Corp, they're going to take their cue from their managers. And so it's very important in organizations that they look at who the representatives are on the ground so that people walk in and think, I've got a problem here. I've got an ethical question. I've got a concern. Are they open to hearing that? And the more organizations pay attention to the integrity and the ethical compass of the people that they promote, the better. Um, the fourth one, the fourth point in time is when those uncomfortable moments happen when someone actually does something wrong, despite whatever you do in hiring, despite whatever you do in sort of imprinting a message, whatever you do with management. And that's the tough part, because people inside the organization and outside the organization will judge whether or not what the company and its leaders say about integrity and ethics mean anything when they find out that there's a problem there. Certainly in the Department of Justice, your first, one of your first questions is, OK, you found out there was a problem in this country by this set of employees doing this. What did you do in response? Did you investigate? Did you discipline people appropriately? Did you fire them? Did you ignore it? Did you promote them? And people within the organization will take a cue that we heard a great speech. We heard a great speech about how ethics are important, but now that we have an issue, have we responded? And to me, I think the, the, what I've seen in organizations, the one place they can get themselves in trouble is when people find themselves having an issue concerning someone they work closely with. It becomes very personal. And people want to be fair in life. They don't want to throw someone under the bus just because there's smoke and not fire. And the smarter organizations find a way to bring someone in from the outside who comes in disinterested and says, you know, I want to be fair to that employee, but I want to be fair to the company. And what's at stake is a collective morality. And the last thing, and I think the, the equally important moment is the first moment, is what to do at when a leader is con um, confronted directly with an issue that's brought to them. And I think one of the things I learned when I was U.S. Attorney is you don't realize how much people pay attention to the smallest things. So I showed up in, in Chicago from New York, and I remember uh, the, it doesn't matter what the policy was, but there was a policy in Chicago that was different than New York. So I honestly had in my uh, question in my mind, should we do things the way we did it in New York, or should we do things the way they did it here? I made the mistake of just asking the question. I said, gee, you do it this way. We did it that way. I'll be very curious as to you know, which you think is better and why. And I instantly heard word back, Pat doesn't like the way we do it here. He's changing things. And that wasn't my um, intention, and I didn't change things. But you realize that people take cues from what you say. And so when someone comes into you and says, we have a problem, I, I made a mistake, here's the problem, and boys are going to have bad consequences, I don't know that people stop and think about what the reaction will say uh, going forward. If you throw things against the wall, if you curse, if you're angry, if you walk through every bad consequence and have this person feel this small, what do you think they'll do the next time? And you know they're going to tell someone else about their experience. And what do you think the word will be? The word will be that he or she says they want ethics, says they want to know about problems, says they want to know if the company is paying bribes overseas, but they really don't want to know. Because when you tell them, uh, they'll take your head off. And I saw experiences where people would come in and tell me things. And I would really, really be grateful when supervisors would come in and say, hey, just wanted to brief you on something important, but I wanted to bring so-and-so with me. And so-and-so brought it to my attention. And I just want to let you know how appreciative this supervisor was 
that this person uh, did the right thing and brought it to our attention and make the person feel good about dealing with a very awkward situation and telling folks, yes, we're going to deal with it. This is a problem. We're, we're, no, we're going to get our heads bashed in for making a mistake. But we're much better off dealing with it right now, and I appreciate your doing it. And I don't think people appreciate how much um, that sends a signal. I was dealing with a, a, a different matter in my private, you know, private capacity recently, and when someone starts to tell you, well, we finally find out what happened because someone met us off-site. No one would meet with us on-site to tell us about what was going on. It's like, I almost didn't need to hear what the person said because, you know, when they're afraid to talk uh, in their workspace, uh, then you have a problem. So my closing note to you is this. I never thought about, um, you know, what leadership meant when they handed you a job when you're a lawyer and they say, okay, now you're in charge. And I never thought, I never took a class on ethics and practice. But I do think, uh, for all those reasons I didn't think about it, I should have. And I think the people who uh, make a point uh, to think about these things and to study these things and think about it in practice, it's incredibly important. Because as much as we are accountable and people who are rightly uh, in, entitled to credit for what they do right and they're held accountable when they do wrong, uh, most of us work in organizations who are shaped by others. And the more we pay attention to what's around us and the more we, we are intentional and deliberate about the culture that we shape, uh, the better off we'll be. And with that, I'll, I'll take questions. Okay. We have mics, if people have questions. Thank you so much for your lecture. I really appreciated it. Um, structural issues aside, do you think that your, your final point, uh, point five, was the issue in the financial crisis and in the financial services industry? Oh, that's a, that's, <laughs> that's a complicated one for lots of reasons. And I'll, I'll openly say I represent some financial institutions. Um, no, but I think when I was in the government, I will say this. It was very interesting to me. No one wanted to talk about the financial institutions a few years back. And when I was in the government, I went to a panel at my college and all the other prosecutors said, don't, why are you going there? Everyone's mad that we haven't prosecuted enough people. I said, well, why don't we just talk about it? And I think what's very, very tough to understand, I, I, I understand that there's a lot about the financial crisis that a lot of people are very, very angry about. I was really taken aback when I was a prosecutor that people started to think there was some sort of conspiracy by prosecutors not to prosecute financial institutions. And I thought, are you kidding me? There are so many people mad about financial institutions. If there's someone out there with the evidence of a crime, they're going to bring it. I think sometimes we have to step back and realize there's a couple of things. First of all, and I'll say this um, unapologetically, lots of things that people do that are bad are not crimes. Um, I, you know, I used to tell folks, you know, and I'll be candid, when I first got here to Illinois, and I'll come back to financial institutions, I didn't like to comment on people would say, is Chicago different than other places? Is Illinois a different state? Um, and I think I just moved here. Uh, I, you know, I've been here three months. I'm not going to pass judgment. Um, ten years later, I started to think, you know what? There's a, there's a cultural issue in Illinois. And I, I was talking to someone, I see him now in the, in, the, in the room, who came from another state who was stunned when they went to a, a government office and saw a tip jar. And, <laughs> and I'm just thinking to myself, okay, do you really think that if you were in Maine, and someone put a tip jar down at the government office for service, how long would that last? About five minutes till the first person saw the tip jar. And part of the issue I see in Illinois is people have become a little bit numb and a little bit accepting, and they say the words, that's the way it is. And my view has always been and remains, no, that's the way you're allowing it to be. And what part of the problem in Illinois is that we have folks who, when they're leaned on, take the view, well, there's nothing really I can do about it, I'm fearful of what the person is on the other side. But if someone tried to pull a shake down in Maine, they'd be scared to death saying, oh, these people in Maine will turn me in. And it gets this uncomfortable place where people need to speak up. And I used to always tell people, you can't expect Illinois to be cleaned up by a bunch of guy, FBI agents with guns and badges going in in handcuffs and people prosecuting them in the courtroom. That is a necessary part of the process uh, that's needed, it's important, but at the end of the day, it's going to be cleaned up by private citizens. So part of it is cultural. Um, and then there were things I used to look at in Illinois and say, can people do that? And you'd look at it, yes, they can. Um, it used to strike me that uh, you know, elected officials in Illinois could give out two scholarships for any reason they wanted, not for, you know, it doesn't have to be for academic ability, doesn't have to be for financial need, 
Doesn't have to be for some unique skill, just two. Like, why would you in good government just tell people, just give out two free scholarships to people who may or may not need it? And so part of what I think the issue of the financial crisis is lots of things happen that uh, people may not approve of that may or may not be criminal. Um, secondly, a lot of what happened, uh, I think, you know, there are lots of people who lost their minds before the financial crisis. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a sense of saying, okay, how do we all deal with it? And then to unpeel it and find a criminal violation on one person is very, very difficult. So I understand the frustration there. The only thing I would tell folks, even back when I was a prosecutor, if you think people are pulling their punches for some unknown reason, that's not it. Uh, those cases were, were, were very, very tough and they're challenging. And I think um, how we reset the rules uh, and how we reset culture where there have been problems are incredibly important. And you'll see that uh, the folks from the Department of Justice and the folks from the SEC and other places and the FDIC, when they deal with banks that have gone wrong, a big part of the focus is what you do going forward and how do we change the culture, how do we change personnel, and how do we have people coming in making sure that things are in the up and up, but it's, it's complicated. Yes? Hello. I'm a student at the Dominican University, Brennan School of Business. Um, I'm a citizen of Illinois, been here, born and raised, and I'm just curious, uh, with Rob Lagoyevic, and Governor George Ryan, what was your role in helping to bring those guys down? Um, so the, here's the thing about Chicago that's very different than New York and most other cities. In Chicago, people personalized the U.S. Attorney's Office to the person who was the U.S. Attorney. And in New York, they attributed it to the office most of the time. Now, most people know who Pete Barrara is. But when I was in New York, if the U.S. Attorney's Office did something, you would hear it on the radio that said, the U.S. Attorney's Office indicted so-and-so today. You know, the U.S. Attorney's Office convicted so-and-so today. Um, in Chicago, they'd say the U.S. Attorney indicted so-and-so today, and the U.S. Attorney convicted so-and-so. So I would literally sometimes be in the shower and hear about something I did um, <laughs> that I neither did nor knew had happened. Um, I didn't like the latter part. I, I knew most of the stuff that would happen, but every once in a while, a case would hit the news that, you, that no one understood it would hit the news, but I'd be showering and thinking, I didn't know I did that. Um, and, <laughs> And what you recognize is that people would, would take the work of 160 attorneys, 150 staff, working with agents at the FBI, DEA, ATF, CPD, some of whom in the violent cases are going through doors where they expect people on the other side to have guns that may shoot at them. And at the end of the day, someone signs the indictment in your name and they say, you know, the U.S. attorney uh, you know, took a gang off the streets today. No, I was sitting behind my desk with a pencil in my hand um, some team of assistant U.S. attorneys were working for months, if not years, instead of all night to get warrants so a bunch of agents who worked for years could go in with bulletproof vests on and take out the gang. So you're responsible for what happens in your office, but you get much more credit than you do. The George Ryan case was the culmination of, uh, of an investigation that began years before I got here. It began under my predecessor, Scott Lazar, but I would say it if Scott Lazar were here, I give Scott Lazar very little credit for it, not because I did it, because neither of us did it. Uh, a bunch of agents and prosecutors made cases. I think at the end of the day, there were more than 70, perhaps 80 convictions in the Governor Ryan case. It grew out of people in a culture where it thought it was acceptable to pay, licenses for bri uh, pay bribes for licenses. So people who are not qualified would go in, pay 200 bucks, and they'd be driving a commercial driver's license. And the culture to me that epitomizes what was wrong with the case was that 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 horrible accident when a driver who had a license obtained by a bribe didn't know what he was doing with the truck and a piece of equipment fell off and caused the van to incinerate that killed the Reverend Willis and his wife's children. And the reaction to that, which to me showed a corrupt culture, was that they fired the Inspector General who was looking into it. Uh, and the Inspector General, I mean, uh, the uh, Inspector General Police, the Inspector General himself was convicted of obstruction. So the reaction to saying, have we lost our mind um, this, this license for bribes is dangerous and people are dying, was to commit more crime. So there, I was not in the courtroom. The, there was a team in the courtroom. There was a team out of the courtroom. And my job was to sort of, um, you know, uh, do what I could to, to help support them. Same with Governor Blagojevich. Um, a team worked on that case. Um, there were, uh, the number of convictions was less, um, but it was hard work of agents and prosecutors who tried the case in the courtroom. So. Uh, did I, did I, was I a busybody and was I uh, involved asking lots of questions? Yes. 
How helpful that was, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, the office collectively did lots of things that they ascribed to one person who did very little of it. Uh, first off, thank you for the talk. I think it could resonate with a lot of people in this audience. Um, sort of, most of your most of your talk came from the point of a prosecutor. What do you? What would you say to the public defenders and Blagojevich's attorney that maybe represents on the defense side? How do you keep your ethics intact when you potentially or maybe not potentially know that your client has? gone further than maybe he should have. Okay. Oh, so I, I was assuming that in many of the cases, and there's nothing wrong with this from the attorney's point of view, the attorneys are representing people they know are guilty. Um, and I just usually talk to folks in my office and say, if you want some inspiration when you're having a hard day, look at the defense attorney sitting at the table behind you. Because, and I would say it this, this crassly, um, prosecutors get to pick their cases. Um, so, if you, first of all, no one should prosecute anyone ever that they don't think is guilty and convinced they're guilty. So you're starting from there, but you may be convinced they're guilty, but you may, may be doubts about whether you have to have the proof to do it. So when the guy walks into the bank and he robs a bank and he doesn't wear a mask and his picture, his face is on the TV and he signs a note um, that he leaves his fingerprints on. Um, and when the dye pack explodes just before he's tackled in the act of robbing the bank by a police officer with the money on him, and he's got three prior convictions, and then he confesses after being Mirandized, he can still tell his defense counsel, I didn't do it, um, or I did it, uh, but make them prove it. And that defense counsel has to walk into court no matter how much they want to look at this guy and say, you're nuts, you're going to lose, this is not smart. Um, and they're ethically bound to not only go in and do it, but to do it zealously. And to watch, I, I would say this 100% sincerely, to watch defense counsel sometimes, against all odds, show up every day and bring it, and get up there and do what they can on behalf of their clients, knowing that you know, every time they try to establish something, it's probably gonna fall apart because there's evidence behind it. Um, in those tough cases, they showed up and brought it. And I would tell folks, you know, most of the time you win. Hopefully we're good at it, but the odds that, 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 that deck you're handed from a, just a trial strategy uh, perspective is usually heavily weighted in your favor. So respect the people who have to go in there, lose repeatedly, and stand up and do it again. And so I think the, I think the pressures of everyone, whether a prosecutor or a defense counsel, who are, um, you know, they want, they want to win, and they have to check the results-oriented piece from, from other issues. I do think Things can get complicated in, when lawyers are dealing with you know, client confidence, et cetera. And so I think the one thing I would say, not just to defense counsel, but the prosecutors, it, there's, it's good in an organization to have a safe harbor. We can walk into someone and say, I'm confused about what the rules of the road are. I'm confused about what I can do. We had ethics advisors in the US Attorney's Office. And being a larger group, we had the luxury of saying, hey, we're in a situation where this person's represented by a lawyer, or we think they're committing a new crime. Uh, we're not supposed to talk to people without the lawyers present. Does this sufficiently remove that we can go in and send an undercover to talk to someone even though he's represented by a lawyer? And what we would do is we'd ask people to write it up, do an analysis, and then the ethics advisor would bring it to me so I could sign it so I own the decision to insulate the liability. I think in a defense practice, if you're in a larger firm, you can have that same function. It's harder if you're a solo practitioner and you just want to make sure that people have the resources to go to get advice when they're confused. But otherwise, I think uh, they have a tough job. Um, and everyone just has to sort of keep their wits about them and say, I know I've lost um, you know, several in a row. Uh, it's not because they're not good lawyers and not trying. Sometimes they just don't have the facts. Yes. First, thanks so much for coming. Yeah, yeah. I think you're a tremendous individual, so being here tonight's a real thrill. Um, your first point on hiring ethical individuals. Sorry. Do you have any tips, best practices, things that you found work really well to kind of weed out the folks that you don't want to join your team? Um, yes and no. The one tip that I would say is finding people who know someone well that you have a bond with can be very, very valuable. And there were a couple of times when 
you would be thinking, how will this person work? And you talk to someone who would politely wave you off. And you'd be thinking, and then you'd be thinking, you know, I don't know, you know, sometimes they tell you exactly why you should wave off, and otherwise they wouldn't, but you'd say to yourself, you know, we missed one. Um, beyond that, uh, I was always wondering, I, I was thinking, how good are we? We think we're asking the right questions to get at something, but in a half hour interview, are we really that good at it? I'll tell you what I tried, since I'm not hiring people anymore in that function. I would try to ask people difficult questions, not in a sweat way, but I wanted to see how they dealt a little bit with pressure but I wanted to see how they would answer questions where they thought what answer I wanted to hear. And so I'd ask them a question. I would use two hypos, one that was about a, um, a really, really bad person, very, very violent, who had killed people and had threatened witnesses, and everyone just wanted them off the street. Um, but then they were interviewing a police officer, and the police officer starts contradicting himself um, in ways that gives you discomfort as to whether or not the police officer saw it, you know, saw a gun in plain view on the front seat of a car in the middle of the afternoon. That ought to make you question, like, maybe the police officer decided he would pull the car over and look for a gun and then claimed it's in public view and asked them what they would do. Uh, I would also give them a hypothetical about being involved in a case where the death penalty was going to be sought and ask them to assume if they didn't already believe it that the death penalty was immoral and how would they wrestle with their participation in a case where the result that was sought would be something they found fundamentally wrong. And I'd like to see their thought process um, wrestling through something that's very, and I really care about the answer. I want to see the thought process, but I also try to pay attention to whether or not they're trying to tell me what I want to hear. And I didn't like, I was always worried about people telling me what I, hearing from folks what they thought I wanted to hear. And when I got to the office, and I, I, if Lila's still here, she'll remember, um, Gary Shapiro was the first assistant who's retiring in a few weeks after 43 years in the government. So I got here. I didn't know this guy from Adam. He was the first assistant. I have no idea whether we're going to get along. So I told him, look, give us, a, you know, give us eight weeks, and I'll tell you whether I think I'm going to make a change. And so he's hanging there after being the first assistant for a long time. I may remove him from that slot. We have a first couple of meetings, and he immediately starts telling me I'm wrong, and I immediately kept him on. Um, because I wanted someone to tell me no. And, uh, and any time I did something that I could get him to say yes to, and my criminal chief would say yes to in those cases, I felt very comfortable. And any time they would say, I disagree, it would make me think long and hard. I might go ahead or not, but I needed to know that that was their honest opinion. And I always worried about folks who were junior, who knew me less, telling me what they thought I wanted to think. Um, and that was important. And I would have supervisors tell me, I, I would sometimes have the hunch, is that person comfortable with this case? Because I have the feeling they're telling me they are, but I wonder if they really, really um, feel that way. And I'd have someone go back and check and find out, yeah, they're actually uncomfortable, and then talk it through. And they would always feel relieved when people came to see them. So um, I would try to put people on the spot a little bit and see if they were trying to tell me what I wanted to hear. But the science behind that and you know, whether I was making it worse or better, I don't know. Uh, fellow right here in the suit and tie. Well, that narrows it down. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you talked about how uh, you know, the, the general public can keep relying on the FBI and the district attorney and other outside enforcement agencies to do something that we ultimately have to hold these you know, corrupt uh, uh, office workers accountable for. And I was just curious, coming from New York, what is the starkest difference you've seen um, between New York and, and Chicago, and, and also I, I know you had a, a, a relationship with Rudy Giuliani, and I'm just curious what you saw in his leadership uh, in New York that kind of, you know, made, that, that really helped turn New York around from where it was before he started. So I'll ask the last question first because it's easy. Uh, Rudy Giuliani hired me, but then he quit, like, well, not quit, he stepped down, like, just as I got there. So I think I overlapped with Giuliani for a couple of months. So I was the junior guy out of a staff of 225 attorneys. So I think I had my interview um, with him for about 15 minutes. Uh, and I think I had a meeting with him another time for about 15 minutes. So I never really got to know him. And, and then it's, it's a long story I won't bore you with. But someone sent me to some meeting at City Hall when he was uh, mayor. And they stuck me. And I thought I was supposed to attend the meeting and sit in the audience. And I got on the stage. And, um, and they wanted me to speak. Uh, and, I was not used to public speaking at that time, and so I, I, I spoke, and then I 
said something like, I used to work for you know, uh, the mayor, and I think this effort was about cleaning up the Fulton fish market in New York from organized crime. Uh, it's much better to prevent crime than investigate it afterward. And when I turned around, I could tell the mayor was sitting there thinking, who is this guy? And he mentioned I hired him. So um, I'm, I'm definitely his, his, his close buddy. He'll be calling me for advice in the future. Um, and uh, so what's different between New York and Chicago? I think it's changing now in New York, but I think there's much more local control in Chicago. In New York City, for better or for worse, if your traffic light wasn't working, uh, if, the, if the fire hydrant was, was spilling water, and if there's a pothole, as, when I was a kid, you opened up these things called the white pages, the yellow pages, and there were blue pages for the government. And you had a 1-800 number, and you dialed it. Um, no one really answered, um, but if you answered it, uh, eventually they'd write down what you said, and then sort of not much happened. Um, and you really didn't know who your local state you know, representative was, and at least I didn't. And I don't think people had the sense that the people who were involved uh, had much, much clout or power. And then you get the sense in Chicago, the way these aldermen, these, the, these wards are, um, they, you know, I, I don't say this in a derogatory way, they're fiefdoms and people, you know, want to know what the alderman says and nothing happens unless the alderman says it's okay. And so I think what that has done, if you just step back and look at the picture, uh, it makes people accountable in the sense that if there's a pothole and uh, a water main break and a street light out and you call the alderman's office and he or she, his, their staff doesn't get anything done, then they can lose a vote. Um, but then you look at the track record of how many aldermen have been indicted and you realize that it has another aspect to it. Um, and so that's tough. And, and I'll say this because I think it's, it's, it's important to say, part of the problem with public corruption is not just the bad you know, stuff it causes, what I call the corruption tax, when you think of how much money goes down the drain due to corruption, and what you could do with that money properly spent dealing with you know, social issues like poverty, education, childcare, healthcare, um, that's huge. Uh, but the lack of public trust, which feeds upon itself, is great. But what does it do to the people who are aldermen who are honest? Because they're sitting around and have to look at the statistics about how many people go to, j go to jail, and they're sitting there thinking, well, if they're honest, and they make sacrifices and they work hard to be um, you know, elected officials, but are people looking at them through a, through a jaundiced eye because of what other people did? So the cost of corruption includes the, the, the honest legislators uh, and elected officials who are dealing with that. But I do think there's a lot more of that control in Chicago than there is in New York. I think New York is having a more powerful city council since I moved out of there in 2000. But I think that's the, the one most glaring distinction. Hi, my name is Matthew Simon, yeah. and I have uh, four children, two are in college and uh, two are in high school. And I'm, uh, the question I would like to propose is we've talked about politics a lot. We touched on the financial situation. And it, it seems to me when you're talking about culture, 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 uh, we are trying to educate our children, sending them to the best schools that we can and then they get out and, and they're getting out and they're looking for jobs. And what are the premier financial institutions? They're Goldman Sachs, they're JP Morgan. And you look and you see what they did in terms of uh, putting financial products together that they knew were bad and peddling them, rigging LIBOR, rigging uh, uh, the uh, uh, currencies and all this stuff. And it, it, so when you talk about culture, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I have children, there are young people here in this, off, in this room here that, that want to uh, aspire to you know, make a difference, uh, go into these cultures. But for me as a parent, I am concerned about sending them there because I know your point is well taken. When I was young, you're impressionable, you look around to see what people do, not just what they say. And so, you know, I am really torn about having, you know, my children or people who I care about going to New York, working for J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, when you see what they did, and there's very little accountability. We've put governors to uh, jail, politicians to jail, have the people that are the presidents of those companies where this has gone on and it wasn't isolated, you know, has there, there not much has happened there. And so 
talk about the culture perpetuating it itself, you know, PR and all that stuff, you know, we'll, we'll bide our time, you know, we'll say what we need to say in order to get, get through this. But we have good children, there are people that are in this business school here. Um, does it make sense to go to New York? So I'll say two things. One, when I graduated from, from law school, I graduated with um, what I thought was a decent amount of debt. Uh, I had the, the advantage of having good summer jobs. I went as in college, I had a great job as a, a full-time doorman and a full-time janitor uh, for like six months a year while I was in college and paid a lot of debt down. And then when you're in law school, uh, law firms will pay well in the summer. So I came out with less debt than some of my colleagues, but I had a lot of debt. And I remember working as an intern in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston, and a guy pulled me aside and said, whatever you do, uh, make a plan, uh, and don't get yourself locked into a, to a, to a large salary. So I went to a, to a private firm in New York, and I spent my first three years paying off my debt and saving up to buy a small apartment so I could live um, because of the whole real estate bubble. And I made it a choice to say, I'm going to live well below my salary so I can have the option to do government. Every time in the U.S. Attorney's Office we had a class of 25 interns, I'd always talk to them and say, when you get to law school, do what you want to do in the beginning. But if what you want to do in the beginning involves making a considerable income, I know you have debts that would make my debt you know, look laughable. Take care of business if you can, because what you want to be doing 10 years from now is hopefully something you want to be doing, not something you never changed, you never got out of because you didn't have the financial opportunity. So you may be very, very happy at a firm and stay there for the rest of your life. That's great if it's by choice. If you want to be a prosecutor, if you want to be a public defender, if you want to work for a nonprofit, you don't want to find yourself six years from now saying, I can't afford to take the pay cut because I've let my standard of living drift up. And now I'm in a job I don't enjoy. I'd rather be doing something that pays less, but I can't afford it. And so I've always told people that um, that was advice that stuck with me and allowed me to do things. And I said, if you ever get in a position that you never leave the high paying job because you're happy there, you can always make up for a lack of spending in a hurry. Um, it's, the, it's the lack of saving part that's hard. So I do think, and I've heard it a lot, there are a lot of people interested in being public interest lawyers or public interest non-lawyers uh, who are saddled with debt and we're affecting our job choices. Having said that, I do think that um, people shouldn't write off you know, New York shouldn't write off Wall Street if they're interested in, in trying it out, particularly if they have a strong support system. If a person goes in with their head about them and says, look, I'd like to try this. I don't want to you know, lose, you know, I'm prepared to walk away. Um, and particularly if they're reinforced with family members, I, I, you know, I hate to think that a bunch of folks uh, who have strong values, who come from uh, places with strong values and schools with strong values, are gonna walk away from industries because that would be the, the worst thing in many respects. We want good people to go into places, even places that have been challenged, and make them better, as long as you know, they keep their wits about them and recognize that they step back and, and you know, be willing to pull a ripcord if they don't feel comfortable. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm from New York, I love New York, I wouldn't write it off. Yes. Yeah. Can I put together two things you said about culture, 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 and yeah. you put two of our governors in jail. Yeah. And everyone in this room who's from Illinois, we should be very proud. We've had four governors go to jail in my lifetime. And we're all very, very proud of that. And thank you for your contribution to that. Uh, but having said that, culture, 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 Mr. Vergoyevich is a very strange duck. Mr. Vergoyevich came up in a certain culture, 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 and has been sent to jail for 14 years. I'm not trying to defend him. I'm asking you as a, an attorney if you think his penalty was too severe given the uh, Governor Ryan's, uh, you know, there was deaths involved, and the other governors, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll say this, because I'm always reluctant to speak in the, um, since I'm not the U.S. Attorney, I want to speak in the U.S. Attorney capacity. What I will say this, a lot of people are asking questions about punishment. Um, and if you look at uh, the recent pronouncements from the Department of Justice, they're looking at the question of, are people going to jail too long for drug offenses? And I'll come back to corruption offenses in a moment. And that's a, a relevant question, and policies there are being looked at. Uh, I became very conscious when I was there a while to think there are people out there who are ruining neighborhoods, that people are afraid to send their kids or grandkids down the street because people are running gangs, and some of those people running gangs are killing people, and then they're threatening witnesses. And as bad as it is, because putting someone in prison, uh, 
obviously is uh, depriving them of their liberty, but it's having a real effect on their families uh, and their, you know, their parents, their children, the people around them. That's a real cost. But there are some people who society needs to remove from society. What we became concerned about was a notion of other folks. Um, you have a really bad person um, who needs to be in jail, but being careful as carefully as you can to be proportional to other folks who are involved in that and making you know, decisions there. And that's a very, very tough balance for people to draw. And that's one that I think has been becoming publicly engaged about what's the right level of punishment. The one thing I would say, though, is, and I don't say this in my current capacity, um, there was a, a disconnect between white collar offenses and drug and violent offenses. And there was a notion, uh, if you think about it, that someone is running a large scale drug enterprise, goes away for 30 years, and then you'd look at some of the financial frauds uh, or some of the corruption that has a much more corrosive effect uh, on the government and the population. And I think one of the issues that Judge Zagel wrestled with in the Blagojevich case was to say, you look at the sentencing guidelines, and they were serious. And yet there was this common perception that if you're caught in corruption, you do less time. And George Ryan had a, a relatively serious sentence in the neighborhood of, I think, eight years. And I think there is a point where people said, wait a minute, why do we have this disparity between, when you think about the harm that corruption causes to a state versus a, a gangbanger, which are very different, um, and, and one can result in violence, but one is really eating at the core of the state, that a message needs to be sent to say, you know what, this is serious. And no one, you know, no one enjoys someone receiving a tough sentence and what that visits on their family. But there's a point where you have to say there has to be some sort of equity between corruption and white collar offenses uh, and crime. And in fact, if you look at a deterrence method, most people would argue that in the white collar context where people make rational choices, which is not about um, uh, other issues, it's when people are making choices, and I'm not talking about the Blagojevich case, and, you know, fraud cases. I want a yacht. I want a nicer house. I want a car, I'm gonna do a gamble. Uh, what are the odds I get caught? And if they think the odds that they caught are small and the punishment is small, they're more likely to do it. And so I think what you saw play out in the Blagojevich case was a sort of resetting of the sort of equities of the scale. And then since that time, other people, I think two other people have been sentenced by, to, to more than 10 years. And so I think in that case, it was a, there was a recognition that, there, that you know, this is a very, very serious harm. So no one takes, joy in a sentence like that, but I do think when you think about it, there's a lot of people in the state who've been sent away for more time, um, who had you know, less choices in life, and the, the, the effect of corruption in the, in the governor's mansion, the point I think Judge Zagel was trying to make, and he said it more eloquently than, than I you know, would, would attempt to paraphrase, was this is serious. If you think that the governor's mansion is a, is a path to profit, let the next person uh, think twice because this is real time. And, you know, that's a, you know, look, punishment is a bad thing. Uh, it is a necessary evil, and no one enjoys sentencings. I was at a law school talk, and I said, you know, no one likes, no one likes to be in a room when someone is sentenced to jail, but it's in, when you're dealing with that, there has to be some sort of equity that says, other people are going away for a long time. If you're causing a real harm, that's, that has to be uh, accounted for. Sure, sure. Could you say a bit more about the culture that formed you, even before you became a You mean my family grew up? Culture? Uh, or the schools you went to, or whatever sure. you think was that whole surrounding that made you the person? I just think there was, if I, if I was to talk about influences on me, first and foremost would be my parents. Um, my parents were immigrants. My father and mother were, you know, sixth grade graduates in Ireland, and they left. My mother, when she was 17, emigrated, and my father came when he was 31. And they were very straightforward. My father just worked to put food on the table for his kids. Um, that's, he just went to work and came home. Um, and um, pretty remarkable. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I don't know why I'm sharing this story. Um, I think he went to one movie between 1957 and 19, uh, you know, when he passed away in 1998. And I know that because he had a, a heart attack in the, in the 80s. And my brother and I brilliantly took him to see Jaws 3D after he recovered. <laughs> um, why take someone who suffered a heart attack to see Jaws 3D? Um, and he saw these 3D glasses. And I think the last movie he went to may have had 3D glasses. And then the first scene 
um, opens up and you know the shark eats someone and he turns to me and says, so is in a, in a thick Irish brogue, so is it over now? Um, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, no. He goes, how long did it last? And I said, oh, it's two and a half hours. He's like, oh. Um, so he was very salt of the earth, very, very, and my mother was the uh, driving force in the family. She was the one that said, uh, um, you know, go to school, uh, do your work. As, as the first lawyer I worked for said, I wouldn't mess with her. Um, and, uh, and then the second greatest influence was probably my high school, uh, which in fact, my, my, and uh, a short brief story, my high school's birthday is this, this um, being celebrated this Saturday after 100 years. And in essence, um, a, an anonymous donor gave a uh, grant in New York City uh, and handed a check to a priest on Sunday and said, build a school for young Catholic boys and send them to school for free in 1914. And the school opened. And for a century, they have not charged a penny of tuition. And in the 1970s, they began to take alumni donations for the first time and outside support. But a single family and honestly endowed a school and educated 125 boys a year um, through for, for decades. And the family has died out. And they've now unmasked the, uh, the anonymous donor. Uh, there's an irony there. Her name was Ms. Grant, Mrs. Grant. Her husband was the late uh, Mr. Grant, who became wealthy as the mayor of New York City during the Tammany Hall days. Um, and so I don't, you know, I, he was a real estate guy. I don't know. Um, but what I'm saying is whatever money he earned um, that his widow uh, gave uh, was a great thing. And the Jesuits were, uh, it was a Jesuit high school and uh, really, really loved that place, uh, still do. And it's, um, it's, uh, it was a, an experience. Of course, I applied and got rejected. Um, and so my mother um, thought I didn't want to go to school because uh, for some reasons it's a long story. So she made me call up uh, and ask the admissions officer why I didn't make the first cut. Uh, I was in eighth grade, uh, picking up the phone um, and calling um, the admissions officer and finding a backwards way to say, could you tell me if I screwed up the math part or the English part was the most polite way I could do it. Um, it was the thing I was most afraid of doing other than telling my mother no. Um, and it turns out there were two Pat Fitzgeralds and I was supposed to get an interview and the other guy wasn't and they put the letters in the wrong envelope. So my mother, for the rest of her life, um, lorded that over me. And, um, and then I went to Amherst College, and that was a very different experience. And I, I got to meet people from a very different backgrounds, and I became fast friends. And so I think, uh, I think it starts with your family and your community in Brooklyn. Um, but I think you know, I'm a big believer in education. And I think the opportunities people have for education are remarkable. I remember going back to my high school and thinking, and I say this to all the faculty here, what you don't realize when you're in high school, because you're a 14-year-old um, obsessed with all other stuff and insecure, is how many people in that school, teachers, uh, administration, faculty, are giving up opportunities to do other things more financially rewarding because they want to spend their lives investing in, in students. And you realize when those, some of those professors, one recently retired after 50 years, what impacts they make on their, on their uh, people who go through school. And the same thing in, in, at a college and a university campus. And so the, the faculty in the room, I think lots of students sort of appreciate it when they're in school, but it dawns on them when they're out and realize, okay, um, you know, your opportunities in life were shaped by people who their goal in life was to give you those opportunities. And so I'm, I'm very, very grateful to the two schools that uh, most affected my life. Okay. 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 All right. All right. Okay. Oh, we'll take maybe one last question. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to speak with us. And I have a couple of questions. So I am a consultant at a change uh, management firm. And we were talking about culture. Uh, it really resonated with me since one of the things that we tell our clients is that culture eats change for breakfast. That culture is a very powerful to an organization and how it drives their policies and behaviors. So, you know, with that in mind, I have a couple of questions for you, and I want to hear, you know, based on your um, experience and your knowledge. One is, um, how can organizations remain or become ethical when its external environment, you know, the external culture, the bigger culture that's surrounding it is hindering its progress towards being more ethical or, being, or staying ethical? And my second question is, um, 
if an organization at this moment is deemed to be unethical in its principles, in its practices, in its behaviors, how can it shift from being unethical to being a more ethical organization without risking you know, too much loss in its resources, too much turnover, too much you know, financial resources being lost? And, and all I'll say, maybe the way I would synthesize that is I think what you have to assess is if there's an ethical problem in the organization, um, where it started, but if you're talking about a serious problem that's throughout the organization, often it's going to need serious management change, both because the people either deliberately or by not paying attention to it allowed a culture to exist that you have to say it's like a baseball team. Sometimes you know, you're not saying that the, the manager is the one who gave up the home runs on the pitching mound or struck out at the batter's box, but if there are a bunch of baseball players and they're not performing, then whatever it is, the, the manager's tricks aren't working um, and you need a, a change of pace. But the act of changing uh, sends a signal and sometimes those are the ones where you need a real force of nature to come in and take over and sort of not feel like they own what existed before. They don't and they don't have to apologize for it. It's easier, you know, when people, when people come into an organization fresh, they can ask all sorts of things. Why do we do it this way? Why do we do it that way? Uh, and then you can change it. Once you're there a while, um, that organization is yours, and so there's a little bit more sense of you're criticizing something you either designed or own, which is why change is healthy. And I think so when an organization is having problems, change at the top in both substance and, and, and symbolism is important, and then it wakes people up because they realize, well, that person changed, and then I think you need, you, know, you need to drive down accountability, and the person has to come in and make an assessment of how comfortable they feel. But, when it's a problem, it, it takes something drastic. You can't really take a real problem and slowly evolve, um, because I think sometimes culture just needs a sort of a shock to the system um, and an external. Um, and, and taking someone out and putting someone in uh, may not be a reflection on the ethics of the person that's replaced, but it may reflect on their effectiveness, at least under those circumstances. And I think most people would look to make a change. Well, thank you very much for your hospitality. I appreciate it. Thank you for your incredibly interesting thoughts and perspectives, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. I'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight, and I'm also going to invite you to join us again at future Dominican events. This includes our C-Suite Speakers Series, which brings business leaders to our River Forest campus. Our next C-Suite event is on Tuesday evening, November 18th, when David McNeil, who heads um, the, the automotive manufacturer WeatherTech will speak to um, students and, and guests. And details are on our website, so I urge you to, to come, although I think it'll be very hard to top your remarks tonight, Mr. Fitzgerald. We hope to see many of you at future Dominican events. Thank you again for coming, and good night.